Hello everybody. Welcome to a special program that the Hardwick Gazette and HCTV are jointly doing to bring you interviews of the candidates in Vermont's primary election. The primary this year is August 13th. We'll be interviewing all the candidates in four Senate districts and five House districts that the 11 towns of the Hardwick Gazette are uh, represented by. So, You'll be able to watch these at hctv.us or read them at hardwickgazette.org and each uh, place will be linked to the other. So we'll bring you now interviews of your local candidates. Thanks for watching. My background is, well, I've been the state senator for the district for the last three terms or six years. I started on the transportation committee with Dick Maz as the chair and Jane Kitchell, which were great senators to learn from my first four years or, you know, all six years that I've been there, but they were great senators to learn from. I was also on the education committee and learned a lot about education in Vermont and the issues that we're, we're facing there, which I'm assuming might be one of your questions because that's definitely a, a big issue this year. Um, but outside the legislative process, and then last, last uh, district, last two years, I also was elected the majority, my, the majority assistant leader, which also is known as the whip. So I did that kind of leadership role the last two years. In the last two years, I was also switched from education to the Appropriations Committee, where I was the vice chair working with Jane Kitchell and learning all about the, the budget process, which has been very interesting and informative. The background that I have outside of the legislative process is I work for the Department of Public Service. I've been doing renewable energy work in Vermont for the past 20 years. So any kind of clean energy, renewable energy policy, and other energy policy work for the state for for over 20 years. Okay. Um, I have come up through local government. I served on the Montpelier City Council, on the uh, Montpelier Planning Commission, and on the Regional Planning Commission for a short time. I served as mayor of Montpelier for three terms. Um, I've also served on Capstone uh, Board of Directors, and I was uh, in at the beginning of the organization that's now become Prevent Child Abuse Vermont. I've been in the Senate since 1997. Uh, for most of that time, I've chaired the Finance Committee, and um, I've served, I think, on every committee other than Natural Resources and Agriculture. So I've got a pretty broad breadth of experience. Uh, my motivation, I love my job. I believe in democracy. I really like solving problems. I like bringing people with diverse backgrounds and ideas together and finding common ground and hopefully moving us all forward. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my uh, formal background is uh, that I have a, a degree in physics and I've been a teacher for uh, just about 20 years. And I so I teach science and math. And I am also a, a mom and a union member. Uh, and I um, am really passionate about uh, uh, well, taking care of, of our community and particularly uh, the environment. I am running uh, because every day I work with high school kids uh, that are worried about their future. And I am uh, very interested in making sure that we have a, uh, a livable future for them uh, that is sustainable, both environmentally, but also financially. Um, and a, a place where uh, ma making sure that Vermont is a place where 
uh, where the, our, our kids know that they can um, have a future and, and be able to um, uh, afford to be here and to thrive here. Well, I'm a lifetime resident of uh, Barrytown. I grew up in, in Barry and uh, went to Spalding High School. Uh, well, first Barrytown Elementary School and Spalding High School. I went to college at Johnson State College where I majored in psychology with a minor in music. I attended the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia for about a year and a half, exploring a call to the ministry in the Lutheran Church, uh, where I decided that that was not the path I was going to follow. Um, shortly after that, I returned back to Vermont, uh, where I held a, a couple of different jobs before getting my commercial driver's license and becoming a uh, truck driver, uh, eight and a half years for Bellavance, and uh, then I went uh, long distance over the road for a couple companies out in Minnesota. Um, for the last 10 years, I have owned my own independent trucking company. And uh, now I'm working uh, under my own authority in collaboration again with Bell Events um, and making plans to actually get out of that industry uh, for various reasons. Um, why I'm running, uh, the state of politics in Vermont, uh, people cannot afford to live here. Uh, the, the governor is trying his best, but the supermajority, uh, one party rule, is just doing what they want to do uh, to, heck with the, uh, to heck with the ramifications. Uh, we need a little bit of balance um, the governor cannot sustain his vetoes, and I'm looking to be part of that balance. I couldn't stand still any longer. Well, I think we, for as far as education spending, meeting the needs of our students and our children is paramount. I think the problem what we have for the education spending is not so much that we're we're not meeting the needs of the students, but it's how we're how we're setting our budgets. We don't have good budget controls, I think the way we vote for for schools. It's it's more, the, the balance isn't so much about meeting our needs and keeping taxes low, but about having local control and setting a statewide education budget. Those two things are kind of in conflict where people vote, but they don't really know exactly how it's going to affect their taxes. It might not, they could raise education spending at their school, but their taxes could go down. It could be the reverse. So we need to have a, a tighter connection between what people are doing at the local level and what their taxes are going to be and and also return to having strict budget control so that we don't have an instances like we did this year with a 14 percent increase so that's i don't i agree that's not sustainable yeah i mean i think that you know the it's always important for legislators to remember that the constitution has the the line in it about we shouldn't be raising any taxes if it's not better kept in the pockets of the taxpayers. And that's something to remember. Uh, that said, you know, I, I did support some of the tax increases that we've had that have been specific. You know, we didn't do the income tax. We The taxes I think that we've done have been very targeted. And, and some of the taxes we did helped lower property taxes. So it's kind of, you you we increased taxes on mutual fund registrations, for example. I was supportive of that as a way to help reduce property taxes. But I I do have in front of my mind that this is taxpayers' money and we shouldn't do it unless it really is meeting a, a need and not just a want. Okay. I chair the tax committee. Finance is responsible for state revenue, anything that's a tax or a fee, amongst other things. Um, and I've joked that people don't let me do their, my job, they don't let me raise taxes. Uh, the one tax that we did raise, uh, the payroll tax, two years ago, it went into effect in July in order to pay um, for child care and to put, it's, we had a real outpouring from the business community coming out of COVID saying they couldn't get employees because the employees couldn't get childcare and we really needed to do something. 
And we did. We hoped that it was a small enough cost to, you know, against the good. But the one tax that keeps going up, and I think most people are talking about it, is the property tax uh, or the education tax, which is based on your property. And we have a problem. Um, I now am on the steering committee for the Commission on the Future of Education, and we will have a school finance section on that, and I hope to be on it. Um, but our school age population has been declining for over 20 years. We have significantly fewer children now in school than we did 20 years ago. The baby boom has graduated. And yet we still have an extensive system of sometimes very small local schools. Uh, I was in the Barry Heritage Day Parade today and several people yelled at me, you raised our taxes. I tried to say back, um, actually, you collectively, the people, raised your taxes. You know, there was the December 1st letter said, if you vote for the school spending, your taxes are going to go up 18 to 20 percent. The school budgets came down um, to around 17, 18 percent increase. We raised $27 million additional um, and bought that tax increase down to 13%. But the way the system works is the people decide how much they want to spend. We subtract out all the dedicated state revenue, um, which is the sales tax, part of the rooms and meals, all the lottery. And whatever is left over to be paid for, then we have to raise it through the property tax. Uh, well, a lot of work was done this year to look at going back to some kind of an adequacy payment, kind of like the foundation formula. Uh, but we also have to keep in the equity system. That is a Supreme Court mandate. So we can't say, Hardwick, you're on your own, we'll give you X thousand dollars a kid, and Hardwick, you can raise whatever you can on the local property tax and Stowe and Sugarbush, you can raise whatever you can, because that gets us back to where some towns had a 28 cent property tax and other towns had a $3 and 28 cent property tax. So we've got to find that balance. And 18 weeks is not a lot of time to do that. So this commission will continue to work. I think we are going to have to face some very hard decisions. Um, people love their local schools, but their local schools are very expensive and it's reached the point um, now where for some people they're unaffordable. And so we're going to have to make some changes. Yeah, I, that is a, an excellent question. And it's also my highest priority going into this next session. Uh, I think wealth inequality is one of the um, worst issues of our time and makes just everything harder. Uh, and so I, one of the things that I um, am very interested in doing uh, is bringing back um, some uh, balance and stability for working in middle class uh, Vermonters uh, in terms of their taxes, uh, particularly their, their property taxes. And uh, so my strategies for doing that, um, I, I would love to see us move uh, closer to an income-based uh, taxing system. There's a great Brave Little State podcast about that. And uh, I would encourage everybody to go check that out. I also um, think that that's a big shift. And I don't know if that is something that we're going to be able to get accomplished in one year, especially since there is a uh, Commission on the Future of Education um, that is currently working on what some solutions might be. So we'll see what that commission comes up with. But in the meanwhile, I think um, we have the opportunity to um, use some 
new data about uh, second homes in Vermont. And I think we could break out the non-homestead tax into its component parts so that we could tax second homes at a much higher rate, um, which should, um, uh, that to me is a, well, it, which should um, uh, provide some relief for uh, middle uh, class and working Vermonters. So uh, I think that is an, a no brainer and something that we should absolutely be pursuing in the next session. And I think we should also be looking at um, uh, petitioning the federal government to uh, pay for mental health uh, services that currently schools are providing. Um, and so th those are a couple of, of things that I think are uh, realistic for the short term, um, but I think we also need some better long term um, solutions. And I uh, have uh, more ideas than that. You know, one of the, the things that um, you know, people talk about is um, adequacy formulas or cost containment. And I think that is um, a, a useful conversation, but I just want to make sure that we're not taking out, uh, t that, uh, you know, taking it out on the backs of kids. What's the right balance? I'm, I'm not really sure. There needs to be a balance. Uh, obviously, um, as the voters have said this year, the current scheme is not working. Uh, this weighted average pupil, whatever count they call it, uh, is smoke and mirrors. Nobody understands it, including the policymakers that created it. Uh, we need to do something different. Um, I would propose that perhaps we consider, and, and this has been raised before and it's never gone anywhere, uh, but absent any other ideas, and I'm willing to listen to any ideas, um, perhaps shifting the school funding away from property taxes as a primary source and creating a baseline um, funding for the schools from the income tax. So we're shifting it to what people can actually afford based on what they're earning rather than the value of their homes. And then if a school district wants additional uh, money for additional programs or uh, students with special needs, they can get that funding from the property tax. Um, but uh, also I think the state should be providing, uh, they're, they're saying that this, this weighted average is to account for students with additional needs that need additional um, staff members on, in the, on the faculty or in the staff to su support staff. Um, I think there are programs to provide for that and those should be provided by the state. We definitely need affordable housing to make it attractive to young people and that people can afford a starter house or, or their own home. And we also need a, a healthy rental market that people could just want to move here for a summer or you know, I talked to Vermont Life folks and they can't even get interns to come because they don't know a place for the interns to, to live for the summer. So they, you know, and I've heard this from schools too, they hire teachers and the teachers can't even find a place to rent. So it's definitely essential part of our economic development that we have affordable housing and just housing in general. Uh, we can put money into affordable housing and, and support which we have been doing and I think we'll continue to do. It just takes time to, to get that bill and have it catch up to the, the market dynamics that are happening with housing. And I think we also can, what we've done last year with the Act 250 and housing bill will help to get more housing built where we don't need to have such a strict environmental review that downtowns, places with sewer, places that are already kind of part of the municipal system, let those places grow and not have we don't need as much review and we can support more housing there. But then maybe in key areas like around our river corridors where we're seeing this flooding and damaging to homes that we do need an environmental review there. So let's focus our limited resources on where we need it and let housing be built in other places. So for affordable housing, it's it's really is federal and state money. And but for other housing, it's it's permitting. And just also, there, sometimes it takes time for the market to, to correct itself. Uh, if I had the answer to that, I would probably be running for vice president at this moment. The housing crisis is national. It's 
Vermont has, we have Act 250, we have some of our own quirks, but I'm a retired realtor. And from what I've been told that because of material and labor costs, you can't build that little slab ranch, you know, the starter home or the retirement home at a price the average working person can afford. Um, it, and so the market isn't going there. There's all kinds of demand for that, but it's not being built. I serve on the housing committee. At least I have for the last two years. And we have done some significant changing um, and we're moving to a different mapping and uh, level system that will be worked through the local level and regional planning. So you'll be able to uh, build in some areas uh, where we want you to build and there'll be no Act 250 and then there'll be some review in the next level and then you'll have full review as you go up the protection levels. So we're trying there. We put over $800 million in federal ARPA funds into building affordable housing, but the building costs are hitting us too. So, uh, you know, if we could print our own money, we might get out of it, but a lot of it comes down to just coming up with enough money plus property taxes and the tight housing market is having inflationary impact on rents. And we're finding that more and more people are being priced out of the rental market. And that's exacerbating the, you know, the homeless structure. Um, we've got people that are homeless uh, that, just need an apartment they can afford and there just aren't enough out there and we're building as as fast as we can so there's no simple solution to this one if I, I think it's really going to take a federal initiative uh something on the scale of the gi bill without all the issues the gi bill had so um i think we'll just keep chipping away at it yeah, that's a great question. Um, so just want to recognize that we do need more housing at every level, um, you know, including re retirement uh, options uh, for people who would prefer to uh, downsize if they could, including, uh, you know, uh, spaces for uh, families to be able to afford to move into. And uh, I think, you know, there are a lot of reasons why we don't have that housing right now. Um, one of those reasons uh, has been Act 250 um, and so this last session, I'm really proud of the work that I did uh, in terms of uh, creating uh, some uh, loosening of Act 250, uh, particularly for uh, affordable housing. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and see what further needs to be done. Because um, I think none of us want to see uh, additional housing uh, that also compromises uh, the integrity of our environment. And I think these two things do not need to be opposed to each other. Uh, but uh, you know, if it's if regulation is not um, the the barrier, though, I am certainly open to having more conversation about how we can be um, streamlining regulation uh, to allow more, uh, particularly affordable housing. Um, I think in the in the meanwhile, I think we we also just need to recognize that housing is an is an investment, and the cost of labor and the cost of materials is a huge barrier right now. Um, and so, uh, as much as we can be um, subsidizing uh, this housing, which will turn out to be an investment, which will get more kids in our schools, which will end up with more workers um, in, uh, in our workforce, which will, you know, end up with more volunteer firefighters, you know, like uh, just in every aspect of society, we just need um, more people to be here. Uh, that, that investment will give us uh, a lot of dividends. So that's, that's one option. Um, another option, um, is, uh, you know, thinking about like creative solutions in terms of um, encouraging home shares. And we, we actually really do have a lot of housing, um, particularly second homes, you know, so I'm going to just come back to that um, topic for a minute, because uh, I think we need to 
uh, be looking at how we are incentivizing uh, people to actually live here. Uh, and if people are going to uh, have a, a lot of, uh, if they're going to have houses that they don't, um, if that they don't live in, um, then they need to really be paying for that. Um, so I, I, um, I know some people have uh, thought about Airbnbs, but I want to leave that up to um, uh, communities to regulate. Well, uh, the governor has even said that we need to make affordable housing a priority. Um, in order to do that, I believe we need to reform the Act 250 process to make it easier to reduce the uh, the the permits uh, the the permit process, uh, which drags out sometimes for years, um, and somebody somebody goes to a, a developer goes to build a uh, a house or a, a building or whatever and uh, has to go get a permit and do an environmental study get a permit get the the zoning permit whatever they get all those permits that they need to do and oh guess what we forgot to tell you there's another permit that you need to get and then somebody files a, a grievance and it gets tied up in court for years and we just need to make it easier um, to get through the permitting process by reforming Act 250. Uh, the legislature did something this year to make it easier for building affordable housing in the cities uh, near public transit, but uh, then they, they actually expanded Act 250 instead of uh, making things easier. And what if somebody wants to build a single family home out in the, uh, out in the countryside? Um, we need to consider that as well. We need to build more permanent shelters if we're going to continue to have this high of a homeless population, which seems that we're ha going to have. Putting them in the hotels, you know, we used to pay $147 a night for years, and that, that definitely wasn't sustainable, largely off of the backs of the federal dollars that we had. So we can't continue to use the hotel program as a permanent housing solution. It's it's a fine program for emergencies during the winter when you have a family that's you know their house burns down they need a place to stay. It's, that's the kind of reason why we had the hotel program. So if we we're actually going to house the homeless, we need to support the shelters and long term affordable housing that are built for homeless people so that they have the services to get them into permanent housing. Uh, so I, I I support what the the Senate has done to try to limit the use of the hotel program, just because it's not fiscally or not able to spend that much money on on housing and hotels. But it will take other money to to support it. So I think like we we increased the transfer tax a little bit on on second homes to try to find some more money so that we can support these kind of affordable housing programs. And we already use the transfer tax now to support the work of the Vermont House Conservation Board, which I think does the, the kind of work that we need to do. It's hard to do it as fast as we need it when all this homeless population shows up so quickly. But that's you know, just kind of the unfortunate situation that it might take some time. Again, I think we need to get rents under control. I'm other places have rent control legislation. I don't know if we could give that to local communities, starting with some of our bigger um, chartered cities that seem to have the bulk um, because rents are going up like the price of housing much faster than inflation and they're they're driving it. So I think we do need to get rents under control. I think we need to continue to put as much money as we can come up with into building. We're talking, there's two kinds of affordable housing. There's perpetually affordable, which is money that people can't afford to pay the rent that covers the expenses of the building. Um, that's what we've been building. But then there's affordable housing for people who have an adequate income. But every time rents go up, and I've heard jumps of like over $1,000 in two to three years, um, we're going to need 
to, I think, get some control on that. Well, I was really pleased that uh, Vermont spent uh, some money to buy uh, motels to convert into uh, um, shelters for folks. And I, I would love to see us continue that. That feels like uh, an easy um, option. If we can get uh, you know, some good negotiation there, uh, you know, so we're not paying an arm and a leg per night um, for hotel rooms. And, and if we can get a reasonable deal on hotels, I'd love to see us um, pursue that. Uh, but then I, I also think that we need some um, just additional uh, uh, support for uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness. And really like, I, I wanna be spending more time listening to the advocates uh, who have these solutions and, and come up with a plan, uh, uh, particularly because uh, you know, homelessness, uh, there, there are many reasons why people end up in homelessness. And yes, we need to um, uh, provide uh, uh, housing for people, but I also wanna be examining the uh, causes of homelessness and how we can be um, supporting people so that they don't end up um, homeless in the first place. But I would also, I, my, my understanding is that um, there's data to show that a housing first model can uh, ultimately save, uh, save us money, uh, that it, it's actually cheaper to like make sure that we get people into housing um, so that they, they, you know, their situations don't spiral and end up uh, costing us, uh, you know, as a society, much more money. Um, so again, that's an investment, uh, but should uh, provide us a return if we can figure out how and where to build that housing. Well, I'm all for helping people that are willing to help themselves. There are homeless in all sorts of sorts, all sorts of circumstances. Uh, there's those that simply choose to be homeless, and uh, I don't understand that, but. If, some people are, are like that. Uh, but if somebody finds themselves homeless because they, they lost their job or they lost um, whatever, they lost their job, they, they may still work, they may have a car, um, but for whatever the reason they couldn't pay their rent, um, there's, there's all sorts of reasons people become homeless and it can happen to anybody. Um, if they're willing to help themselves, I'm willing to help them. Uh, hand ups, not handouts. Um, but we need to stop importing the homeless. Uh, build it, they will come. And uh, we make it easy to be homeless in Vermont. I uh, just heard that somebody who's, who recently moved from Vermont to Florida said, there's no homeless down there. Uh, there's no panhandlers. Uh, but you come up here, they're all over the place. So what, what we do about it, I really don't know. Um, but I'm willing to provide uh, resources and uh, fund agencies that will give the money to those who need it or, or the, the assistance. Well, for transportation, we did do, took a little step towards that this year where we added a fee for electric vehicles that'll start in, in January of 2025. Um, you know, the governor talks about not liking any fees or taxes, but this was one he didn't right. complain about and then was happy to, to agree to. So that, that will help a little bit. The money isn't at first going to go to infrastructure. It's going to go to the electric charging infrastructure so we can make sure that lower income people have a way to charge their cars or people that live in apartment buildings that don't have garages or, or they don't kind of control their property to, to put up charging stations. But that will switch to helping funding our roads and bridges. But it is a major concern. As somebody on transportation for the past six years, there is a huge... A kind of yawning gap in our transportation infrastructure funding compared to the need. We we rely a lot on the federal government. You know, we would like to see more support from the federal government. The federal government hasn't raised the gas tax or, or raised the, the kind of contributions that they provide for decades. So that that is, you know, hope, but we can't just kind of hope that the federal government bails us out. So we do need to change the way we're collecting taxes to meet these needs and the needs are growing because of the destruction of 
of our roadways that are next to, to waterways. So some of the resilience work that we did last year around flood protection and flood mapping. So we kind of know where these areas are that we can predict a little better and we can, so we can kind of build the infrastructure to protect those assets where, where needed. We've been slowly doing that, you know, replacing old culverts to, to a, a much bigger size so that they can handle the kind of flash flooding events so we don't get so many washed out roads. But we have thousands of culverts, so it's a, it's a long process. I do support the, the state helping the towns because these little towns that have these major weather events really are not capable of rebuilding their infrastructure in a timely way that's necessary. And they don't have the financial resources. They just have to borrow the money from banks and pay interest where the state should set up a program specifically for municipalities. There was there was a small program last year after the flood, but I think it should be a permanent program where the state is loaning money to the to the towns for this immediate needs that they have, so they can pay their contractors and the, you know the excavators and all the workers that are rebuilding the roads and bridges immediately, and you don't have the contractors having to wait for for money. But we did start this kind of resiliency work last year, but part of it is is the proper planning and input from the towns and homeowners that live in some of these areas about what we're going to do about homes that are right on river areas that might not be in a floodplain, but have been flooded three times in the past year. Okay. We did put in some um, road usage that uh, legislation this year. So we will be moving. Um, I'm trying to remember the details. It was, you know, but a percentage of our cars are electric. We will start charging a road usage fee, which will be paid, I believe, when you have your inspection because your mileage is red then. Um, because, yes, electric vehicles do need to help us fill in the gap to just maintain the roads and the bridges we have. We have a ways to go with resilience. Um, we're a mountainous state and we built on the flat land along the rivers. It was our transportation, it was the power for mills and it was our septic system. And um, we've been working out of that. It is no longer our septic system. Um, it's not powering much in the way of mills, if anything, now. But we are going, we're working, um, we're working on new maps. FEMA is working on new maps. The maps that are presently there don't reflect the new reality. Um, so we need to get a new mapping system. We need to do planning. And there was legislation this year um, to, to um, map floodplains, map, uh, and then do the zoning that would limit any kind of development in the floodplains. Fair amount of that is farmland. So we're going to need to find a way to compensate farmers. Um, I think we started. It's just that one year between major floods, um, isn't enough time to do anything significant? Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, um, so just a, a couple of thoughts on that. One is that uh, I supported a couple pieces of legislation uh, this last session, uh, one being the Climate Superfund Bill, uh, which would require that the world's largest oil companies that have some kind of a nexus with Vermont uh, end up their share for uh, damages uh, as a result of climate change and also any uh, mitigation efforts like increasing the size of culverts uh, or lifting utilities out of the basement, that kind of thing. Um, you know, we're not likely to see um, any funding from that, you know, a check from the oil companies for a few years. Uh, but I'm glad that we actually at least started that process, um, you know, better now than later. Um, but the other thing, too, um, you know, so that, that doesn't help us in the short term. Um, you know, in you also mentioned the um, the fact that we're transitioning increasingly to electric vehicles, and one of the other pieces of legislation that I supported um, was uh, an increase in registration fees for um, electric vehicles. 
uh, because they are not paying the gas tax, uh, but they are using the roads. And I know, um, I mean, I, I consider myself an environmentalist, but I also think like, I, I think we all value having uh, functional roads, uh, whether, you know, regardless of what kind of vehicle we're driving. And, and it's only fair for people who are um, benefiting from uh, a service to also pay for that service, um, which in this case is, is functional roads. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of, of having EV drivers contribute to, um, to road maintenance as, as well. Um, now, though, in the short term, that uh, fee was going to be going towards more EV infrastructure, um, which I think is also desperately needed. Um, but in the meanwhile, I mean, so much of that burden is uh, born, you know, of, of the damaging uh, weather events is borne by municipalities. And so we are going to continue to need to um, look at how we are right sizing uh, our infrastructure for extreme weather events um, for our municipalities. Okay, so I, I don't think that any reasonable person can deny that climate change exists. Uh, I think the climate has been changing since the beginning of time, and it goes in cycles. Uh, largely, I think we're limited on how much effect we have on that. Uh, but we can do, we need to do what we can. Um, we've done a lot in the uh, um, emissions reductions, uh, both in uh, trucking, I'm a truck driver, um, and uh, the, the filters they put on my truck engine now actually put out cleaner air than they take in. Uh, and uh, you, you see very few trucks going around now putting out black smog. Uh, they used to drive down through Linden, New Jersey, and you could smell the, the um, energy plants. Uh, now those have been all cleaned up, and um, so there are things we can do that, we've, that we do, and we need to consider what we can do and what we can afford to do. We seem to be in a cycle right now where we're getting a lot of rain, heavy rains, overwhelming our rivers. Um, these weather events happen. We need to be prepared for it. And I believe that the uh, local municipalities should develop a plan and the state should be there to support it uh, in, in whatever way they can. Uh, so when that plan gets enacted, the state provides resources to assist. Uh, I think uh, I'm hearing more and more we need to dredge our rivers. And the governor has said, well, that's not feasible. Well, they'll dredge the entire Winooski River or the entire Stevens Branch, whatever, for it's going through Barry and Montpelier, is not feasible. But they need to do selective uh, dredging, I think, and riverbank stabilization, create an actual channel in the middle of the uh, river so that the current stays in the middle instead of eroding the riverbanks. But going through Barry City, the river was at one point re relocated and uh, used to be where Merchants Row is. And, well, they wanted to build up Main Street and Merchants Row, so they created a, a man-made channel through Barry with uh, granite sides. And that's just filling up with silt. So we need to dredge that out in key locations so that the, uh, the baseline water level is lower so that there's more capacity to handle the uh, the greater flow of water. Yeah, I support full reproductive autonomy and reproductive rights, you know, supported the constitutional amendment that we did last election into the Vermont Constitution to make sure that that's always a protected right. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm basically just fully supportive of women having full autonomy over their bodies. I don't support any restrictions on, on abortion. I think the medical profession and the ethical standards and the licensing standards that doctors have to go through is the sufficient protection to protecting the, both the women and the, and the fetus from any kind of malfeasance uh, on the part of the doctor you know, the people bring up, you know, super late term abortions there. There's a way that the doctors in the licensing boards will deal with that. And I think that's the proper place to deal with that and not the state legislature trying to, to mandate at what exact point an abortion can or can't be carried out. I think Vermont um, has done probably the utmost 
that we can right now. We have a constitutional amendment that was voted in by the people that guarantees reproductive freedom. I was on the Health and Welfare Committee when we drafted and submitted that amendment. Um, I think these are very personal decisions and they need to be made by the woman and whomever is she feels she needs to include in that discussion. Uh, we have made it uh, provided sh sheltering uh, for anyone that comes here for reproductive services. We won't send information back to Texas. Uh, thank you. That is a great question. I am really uh, glad that we have uh, protected uh, reproductive uh, rights uh, in our state constitution. Um, I um, I think the overturning of Roe versus Wade is a very um, scary thing for um, not just women, but for everyone in the country. I, or I think it ought to be scary for everyone in the country. Um, I, I I think it's um, uh, just a, a real shame that we're that we're in this time right now, and uh, it it is certainly in my um, uh, interest and values to uh, do everything we can to protect uh, a, a woman's right to choose, but also you know for for anybody who is coming here um, to to receive services, um, you know I uh, I know that that is. Um, not always like it, it's a scary thing for a woman to uh you know go out of state to get an abortion that they need uh and uh so as much as we can be uh protecting uh people who come here uh for uh, abortion services um i i think we need to be uh protecting people uh as much as we can well the supreme court returned the issue to the states uh i've probably would not have gone as far as they went. Um, I was, I, I had accepted Roe v. Wade. On a personal level, I do not believe in abortion. Uh, I also don't believe in government interference. And I believe in uh, uh, all knowing and all forgiving God that is with a person as they make that horrible decision. Um, that said, it was returned to the states and Vermont made it clear and put it right in the Constitution. And it's not an issue of my campaign. Uh, and uh, I, I, I believe in following the Constitution uh, and not just parts of it that I agree with, all of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, we already talked about uh, education funding and property taxes. And I, you know, I want people to know I, that I understand the, the, the hurt to some people, but it's also important to remember that there are some districts that have their taxes aren't going up. And so it's the, the I think there's some kind of misinformation coming from, from the governor and, and the Republicans about what the, what the Democrats did last year. And that we purposely, like we wanted it to be 14%. We were trying to get it down as low as we could, but at that late, after all the school budgets vote, there's only limited things that we can do without totally upending how, the local control. It's like when I first got there, there was a lot of fights about closing schools. Uh, so you don't hear people that talk about how we could lower property taxes saying the things that would be very unpopular, like closing schools. And that when we had those discussions, they were pretty uh, upset people about the opportunity, you know, talking about they need to close their schools or lay off teachers or not do the universal meals program, which isn't going to really save that much money anyway. But I, I think it is important that we have a system that doesn't have these kind of tax increases, all, all that said. And, we, and, and we're, I think, working on that. I think the other thing that I wanted to say is that there's a, another thing that I hear people saying why those that, of us that were incumbents not be reelected is the clean heat standard, that it's something that we have been enacted. We didn't, we enacted a bill, but the clean heat standard is wasn't to, to go in in uh, in effect, but just to study it. And I think it's important that we look at that as we look at making Vermont more affordable, because I think imported fossil fuels aren't an affordable solution for our 
heating and power needs. And we need to look at ways we can support the local economy. And I think Vermont has a really great opportunity to build on our economy with local renewable energy sources. And that includes wood that's from our local forests and supporting the forest products industry. And it's something that really excites younger people about Vermont, that we are a state that's leading on renewable energy development and renewable energy economic development. So I want to continue that work. I, we've heard a lot of talk about age in this um, election cycle. I am the senior member right now of the Senate. Uh, we have lost uh, a great deal. Last year, last session, we lost a third of the Senate. We had several senior members retire. The result is that over half of the Senate will be have one session or less under their belt. And I think it's important that we, I found that as I age, I, I find myself using the word balance more and more often, that for democracy to work, we really do need a balance of um, points of view, age, ideas, uh, you know, sexual orientations, you name it. The more people that are involved in that mix, the better the system will ultimately function. And so I, I think I'm asking to have my experience sent back. Uh, I think last year uh, there were a flurry of tax bills. Um, most of them, not, they didn't make it through the Senate because when you've only been there one session and it's been good times, you don't have any experience of the bad times when you need those extra ability to pull in extra taxes to keep from having to make some really painful, you know, we've done some really bad things, including underfunding, you know, pensions, um, just to stay afloat during bad times, you know, during hard economic times. So uh, I think it's important. Um, that we we maintain that balance and uh, get a good mix in there so we can function well. Yeah, well, so um, I uh, continue to be, uh, you know, passionate about um, protecting the environment. Uh, and I, I want to make sure that as we do that, that we are um, uh, keeping a, a balance of, um, you know, the focus. Well, I, I should say keeping a, a balance of um, you know, protecting the environment and also um, ensuring that we're taking care of um, those folks in our community who are uh, most likely to be impacted uh, by things like adverse weather effects and, and that that burden is um, not overly placed on, uh, you know, uh, uh, people of low income or people of color uh, in, in our communities. So, you know, just thinking about how we um, move forward with environmental policy, uh, it's got to be uh, centered on on um, protecting our, our low income um, neighbors. Well, I'm uh, I'm a get real candidate. Uh, get real is a, a state party um, platform to uh, get more con more moderates elected uh, and. Uh, uh, one of the things is the Global Warming Solutions Act reform. Um, and uh, all these social, socio-environmental policies that the, um, the majority in the legislature are pushing that are really breaking the backs of Vermonters and making it difficult. They're regressive, uh, creating regressive taxes, making it difficult for people to afford to live here. And uh, we need to uh, repeal the Global Warming Solutions Act and return these energy uh, mandates that they've created to goals and kind of make it a natural process. So, yeah, we have the, the goal of 
reducing our carbon emissions, reducing our, um, our dependence on fossil fuels, uh, combustion engines, uh, but setting a date of 2030, 2035 is unattainable and hugely expensive. We just saw what happened uh, when we had the, the solar eclipse and uh, people had all the, came from out of state, had all these electric cars that they couldn't charge for eight hours because the, the charge ports were all plugged up. We just don't have the infrastructure in place and it's going to take far longer than that than what they've given us to put it in place so we need to we need to slow down and as people buy those cars the infrastructure will come in on a natural at a natural pace